going to invite you to join me in standing once again as we give honor to the reading of our scripture passage from John chapter 20, verses 24 through 28. We're going to advance a little bit through our Lenten season and for a post-resurrection story uh, about Jesus and Thomas. Hear these words uh, from chapter 20 of John's gospel beginning in the 24th verse. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, I want to tell you before we start the sermon time that you all are my favorites. You showed up on time. You recognized that your clock had to be moved forward. Uh, Those that are going to show up here in about 40 minutes are going to feel really silly. So y'all did a great job. Uh, For those of you who are in the midst of a season of fasting in this Lenten season, I want to remind you that you're halfway through it, you're almost there, you're doing a great job, keep it up. Uh, We're halfway through this journey of Lenten, halfway through this sermon series uh, called In the Wilderness. We've been looking at some of the spiritual seasons of wilderness and isolation that we experience at certain points in our lives. Uh, We've talked about the wilderness of loneliness and the wilderness of want, and this morning we journey together into the wilderness of doubt. Uh, We have been pairing each one of these wilderness experiences with one of the ancient spiritual disciplines of the church that were meant to bring people into closer communion with God and the community. And this morning we're going to pair the wilderness of doubt with the spiritual discipline of worship. Uh, You might not think it, but, but doubt is actually very common in the church. It's not something that we talk about a lot kind of a secret that we don't acknowledge out loud. For some, it's a a secret shame that they hold on to in their hearts. But there are many people that gather in church, Sunday after Sunday, this church and many churches all over the world, who come with a certain measure of doubt in their heart. They worry. They're uncertain about their faith. But if there's one thing I've come to observe in 13 years of ministry in the church is that there is an ever-present undercurrent of doubt among those who call themselves the church. This doubt usually only gets expressed in safe places, certain places. Pastor's office one-on-one, a small group setting between the closest of friends. It's a doubt that God won't save them. It's a feeling that their sins are too much even for God to forgive. A doubt that anyone, even God, could ever really love them. It's that question of, is this faith thing even working? Why do I keep doing this over and over and over again? Why does everyone else seem so certain when I'm so filled with doubt? It's very hard to be in the wilderness of doubt because Christians tend to deny doubts by and large. We have to admit that modern Christianity feels kind of like a a propagandist movement. I mean, we're trying to spread the message. We're, We're trying to spread the ultimate truth of the universe. We are actively trying to convince others of the truth of the gospel message. And in this, there is little room for doubt. And there is an unspoken, and sometimes in some churches spoken, peer pressure. The church has been known to wound and reject those who express any measure of doubt. For many generations, the church was not a place where you were allowed to even ask questions. Questions were were deferred. Instead, the faithful were told to accept the churches, the denominations, the, the pastor's teaching, or else. Those feeling a sense of doubt were told, don't doubt, just believe. As if it were that easy. The simple truth of doubt is that 
It's a difficult road to walk when surrounded by the faithful. It can be lonely. It can be frightening. Isolating. All we need to do is look at this morning's scripture passage and see that doubt is a difficult thing to experience among the faithful. Just look at how the church has cast Thomas over the last 2,000, 2000 years, two centuries. He's not just Thomas the disciple. No, he's doubting Thomas with a capital D. That's his whole identity. That's all of us, any, all of us remember about him. It's not the only thing any of us know about him. It's unfair. It's unfair to poor Thomas because really he's one doubting disciple among many doubting disciples. He just gets singled out and labeled. All we have to do is take a few steps back to verse 19 of the same passage to see that Thomas was not alone. The post-crucifixion story reveals that the other ten disciples were just as consumed by doubt. They'd locked themselves up in a house out of fear that the Jews were going to come and do to them what they'd done to Jesus. And without a clear understanding of the resurrection that Jesus spoke of, you can imagine how defeated and alone they felt in that locked room. Their absolute certainty of who Jesus was has been crushed, it's been rocked. Through pain and heartache and torture and death, everything that they've come to believe is thrown into question. They're all lost in the wilderness of doubt. Until that moment when Jesus miraculously appears in their midst, through a locked door, Jesus comes to the disciples, showing them the wounds in his hands, the wound in his side, instilling peace in their hearts, stilling their doubt and fear, breathing the Holy Spirit on them. And we're not sure exactly how or when, but eventually Jesus departs from them. And sometime around then, Thomas walks in. He's like, hey guys, I think the coast is almost clear. I think we can go out. So, what, 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 what happened? What? Y'all look like you've seen a ghost. What, what, did I miss something? And they tell him this story. And Thomas says, <laughs> yeah, right. I'm not saying you guys are liars. But I'm going to need some proof here. If this Jesus really comes back, I'm going to need to put my fingers in the holes in his hands. And I'm going to need to put my hand in his side. Because apparently visual inspection wasn't enough for Thomas. And Thomas is pragmatic. He's scientific. He wants real, tangible proof of the resurrection or he just can't believe it. He's certainly not going to just believe because they say he should. You know, one of the fascinating parts of the story that I never paid much attention to until preparing for this sermon is the fact that it says it takes a week, a week between when the disciples see Jesus and when Thomas sees Jesus. Sunday to Sunday. Somehow I always thought it was a shorter period of time. That must have been a long week for Thomas. Can you imagine? Because the disciples weren't talking about anything else, were they? I mean, that was it. They were pumped. They were psyched. This was awesome. Hey, Bartholomew, you remember when he ghosted into the room and then through the door? Wasn't that awesome? The way he breathed the Holy Spirit on us, showed us his hands. Remember, he was all like, peace be with you. And resurrected Jesus is so much better than regular Jesus. Thomas, you were, oh, you weren't there. How hard must that have been for Thomas? Have you ever just missed seeing something that everyone else saw but you? Do you remember those, uh, magic eye posters they used to have in the mall back in the 90s. I always think the 90s is 10 years ago, but it's really a long time. Um, <laughs> those magic eye posters, they kind of look like colorful static, and apparently if you like looked at them and unfocused your eyes and looked at the center or something, an image would appear. I never saw one of them. Not one. Everyone else walks in and they're like, kitten, star, sailboat. And I'm just like, I got nothing here. <laughs> I had a friend that, that went on a whale watching trip while he was on, 
vacation. And no matter which side of the boat he was on, the whales breached on the other side of the boat. And everyone on the boat was ooing and eyeing and saying, oh, they're so majestic and beautiful. We're so lucky, blessed to witness Mother Nature in all of its glory. And he's just like, I don't even believe in whales. I don't think they even exist anymore. They're, whales are officially make-believe. The church does a, a really bad job of telling people that it's okay to have doubts. The seasons of doubt are, in fact, a normal part of your faith journey. Some of the greatest heroes of our faith have experienced seasons of doubt. When John the Baptist, the man who literally baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, was thrown into prison, he sent his followers to Jesus and said, are you the one we've been waiting for, or is it supposed to be somebody else? Mother Teresa, who dedicated her entire life to serving the poor and the sick and the dying in Calcutta, expressed doubts and gr that grieved her soul. She struggled at times to pray. She felt alone and separated from God. Martin Luther King, behind his great public dignity, was plagued by contradictions and self-doubt. Threats against his family caused him to doubt whether his message was really worth the cost. Even the strongest and most faith-filled people can experience times of doubt. And the reality is that doubt is a part of a healthy faith. The great Christian writer Philip Yancey once said, where there is only certainty, there is no room for faith. Doubts can serve to draw us into closer connection with God and his people. They can move us into the deeper waters of faith by forcing us to dig deeper, by asking us to ask the big questions. And that's only if the church is seen as a safe place to express those doubts and ask those questions. Only if the church is seen as a refuge, not only for the faithful, but for the doubtful. The struggle with doubt is that many of us feel there's no place for it in church. And the first inclination of someone walking through one of these seasons is to draw back, to pull back from the church. There's a tendency to self-isolate. We don't share what we're going through. We suffer in silence, we suffer alone, perhaps because of our shame of lack of belief or because it feels wrong to face those who seem so certain. And this often leads to someone drifting away or leaving church altogether. Even worse, the church can turn its back on someone who doubts. In our uncertainty of how to be loving and kind, we intentionally or unintentionally pull back from the person experiencing the doubts in the first place. So what are we to do? What are we to do when we find ourselves lost in the wilderness of doubt or we're walking beside someone who is? I believe that this is the time when we are called to engage more fully in the spiritual discipline of worship. I know worship may not seem like a spiritual discipline to some of you, uh, it is so much a part of who you are that it doesn't feel right. If Sunday goes by and you aren't in church, it feels alien and strange. I love you people. I'm grateful for you. But for many, it takes some serious work to engage in the act of worship. For some people, it was work to get here this morning and not just because of the time change. They had to go through a process to steal themselves to come and be present. For someone experiencing serious doubt, it can take self-discipline to keep coming back again and again and again. But worship at its best draws us into deeper communion, not only with God, but with one another, with the community. To surround yourselves with people who love and care for you, for your ultimate well-being. And those times when you don't feel like going to church, those are probably the times you need to go to church the most. Because worship helps us to re-engage with the story, reminding us of those truths that we already know but sometimes forget. Thomas doesn't believe. He has serious doubts about what the disciples have experienced. And yet what is amazing to me in the story is that he sticks with the community. 
For that whole week, he doesn't leave them. He remains with the disciples even in the midst of his doubts. When Jesus appears a long seven days later, Thomas is still there with the gang. You know what this tells me? That Jesus is most likely to work with and in community. It's not that God does not truly do some impressive one-on-one work in Scripture, but his great work in Jesus seems to be rooted in a larger community of faith, supporting and loving one another. It's harder to find Jesus on your own. Worship remains the place where people are most exposed and most often experience the love of God. Something about this time of intentionally seeking God's presence together can break through those walls of doubt and fear and shame and guilt and all the other baggage that we carry with us into these places and among these people. What I want you to know as your pastor is that if you are in the midst of of a season of wilderness of doubt, you do not walk alone in this. You are joined by a host of biblical heroes, laypersons, pastors, prophets, who have experienced exactly what you're experiencing. Seasons of doubt can be part of your journey. But I pray that you will not let them be the end of your journey. Because for more people than I can count, I have seen people come out the other side of a season of doubt with a stronger and a more resilient faith. It's like a marriage. When we stick with it through the seasons of difficulty and hardship, we come out the other side stronger. Stay engaged. Stay connected. Worship in spirit and in truth. Share with your friends, your loved ones, that you have your doubts. Allow us to pray with you. Allow us to encourage you. Allow us to be the practical, practical, tangible ways that God shows you He is still with you. Allow us to remind you again and again and again that you are loved. That you matter. That God is not so far.